As Jeff says, we're going to look up here at the Sky Bible on the back wall. <laughs> I'm going to be reading out of the King James today, chapter 21 of, uh, of Genesis. We've been talking about the great rescue. God rescued us. The whole Bible is about God's rescue plan. We did very little in it. What we did don't really matter as much as what he did in it, but it's the great rescue. Genesis 21, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. I want you to get these places where it says this uh, over and over. But uh, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, and at a set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised him, the son Isaac, being eight days old as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when the son was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. That's where I want to stop at today. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you take the word. Lord, that you would take the word, God, and help us find what you want us to find out of that word today. Help us see the truth. Help us see the rescue. Let us see the joy that you have in bringing us our salvation. God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. <clears throat> today, I want to talk about how to fulfill your dreams. I'm kind of using that tongue-in-cheek you'll see in a moment. I don't think we have as much to do with it as God about fulfilling our dreams. But God is a great God. Uh, in this passage, if I'd read on, you would find that Abraham, uh, he's in, uh, uh, he heads on over and he starts in Beersheba and there he uh, sojourns there. Abraham plants a tree. What Abraham is doing, a lot of people when they buy a piece of land, I mean, I, I know a lot of my relatives did. When you buy a piece of land, you find out where the markers are. You plant a tree on your four corners or right near there. And you'll always remember right there is my property line and over here is my property line. And there's another thing like uh, sometimes if there is a decision to make who does this land belong to, they want to know who mowed it. You know, if it's kind of having a hard time, they want to know uh, has anything been planted on it, who planted it. So if, if you planted the tree on there and in the other person didn't cut it down or make you remove it, it probably has been conceived for a long time as being your land. And, you know, uh, we'll find right up in the next chapters here where Abraham goes and buys a cave. And it's a cave where he wants his loved ones to be buried in. And uh, he pays 400 shekels, which was a lot of money. But he is going into the land. He's establishing. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you this land. I'm going to give you a promised land. I'm going to give you this, this city. And he's going through the land. Abraham is. He's, he's, he's doing exactly what God said. God says, get up from here and go. And he's going. And, you know, he's been going for a long time. And God said, told him, it was something like 25 years ago, God told him he's going to give him a son. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so, being that the son did not come, you know, like, what's up with that? God said it was going to happen. A lot of times, God's promises take a while to get there. A lot of times, our dreams, we have to go a lot before we come to the, the reality of our dreams. And so, in the process of this, a lot of times, we get impatient. And we don't want to wait on God. We don't want to wait on what God's got planned in our life. And, uh, and it's okay to dream, but it's better to dream God's dreams. It's better to do what God said. We'll find one of the things about we'll learn about Abraham and Sarah, in spite of the fact none of their dreams came true right away, they stayed faithful to God, to the most part. They are human, you know. One of the things I'm finding out as I'm going through the book of the Bible once again, starting at Genesis, I'm finding out there are no dysfunctional, uh, there are no functional families in the Bible, not one. Go back and look all the way from Genesis to Revelation. There's not one functional family, not even, not even Jesus' family. Very dysfunctional. Now, Jesus wasn't dysfunctional, but his family was. And you'll go through the Bible in the Old Testament, and you'll, you'll find every kind of sin and everything, and you'll find it uh, with people that don't know God. You'll find it with people that know God. We have just saw in the last couple of weeks where Abraham lied several times calling his wife, uh, that his wife was his sister. Because they were in a land where they would just, you know, kill the husband and take the wife. 
And I got to say, Abraham's got something going on if his wife is at 70 years old and people would still be willing to kill Abraham to get his 70-year-old wife. She must have been smoking hot, right? 70 years old. Hey, we get in this town, I don't you tell everybody, I know you're 70, but my God, you're a gorgeous woman. And I want you to, uh, I want you to be sure uh, to just say you're my sister. And, uh, but <laughs> that's what happened. And it's, it makes me feel better to go through the Bible on David's sin and Abraham's sin and Adam's sin. And, uh, you know, we're all a part of the Adam's family. We're creepy and we're goofy and we're sinful and we're all of those things. And in spite of that, though, we are human. Human make mistakes. Some people say, well, you get really close to God, you won't sin anymore. Show me where that's true. People still sin. Bob said, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. <laughs> and he said, if you sin, the love of the Father is not in you. And if you go back and look at those words, that's in 1 John's writing. It tells you that if you habitually sin. And so if it's habitually, you're doing the same sin over all the time. You don't feel bad about it. You, you haven't got any help from God. Uh, uh, last week, Jeff shared about Abimelech. It said that uh, because of uh, Abraham saying, this is my sister, and uh, he took him and he was going to take Sarah anyway, and God shut up their wombs of the women. You're like, oh, what's going on there? He didn't want any offspring. He didn't want another Ishma situation. And then he told Abimelech, I kept you from sinning. You think about that for a moment. God said this, you know, it wasn't a part of the original story. Abimelech over there, he said, I kept you from sinning. When Jeff shared that, it just jumped out at me. It's God that keeps us from sinning. Over in the last book of the Bible, Jude talks about to the only God that can present us faultless. The only God that can keep us from sinning. And so we got to understand that when God talks about the ability to deal with our sin, God dealt with our sin on the cross of Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God shed His blood. He was our substitute. He was the Lamb that provided our salvation. So you learn to be faithful no matter what. Some days you're on the mountaintop. Sometimes you're in the valley. Sometimes you're the bug. Sometimes you're the windshield, right? It's just those days happen. Those days happen. So we got to learn to be faithful. He said his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. And I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. God wants us to be full of joy. God wants us to find our fulfillment. But he wants us to find our fulfillment in him. Not in us. Not in our abilities. You know, if we thought we got to heaven on our ability, when we get to heaven, we go, well, what did you do to get to heaven? It'd be a place of boasting. But it said, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself. Not of yourself. You're not getting to heaven because of yourself, but you're getting to heaven because of Jesus. So uh, we want to be as faithful as human beings can be. We want to get up and keep on going. We want to keep believing in God when sometimes it's very difficult to believe in God. We want to learn to hope. You know, I had my grandkids down yesterday, and uh, we... Uh, I took them out fishing. My, my birthday present was they dropped three kids off at my house, and I took care of them all day. <laughs> but it was a joy. I took them out on the lake, and uh, we were fishing. And, like, we got there, and about the time I got the boat anchored and all this stuff, and the wind was kind of blowing, and I was trying to stay on a spot, and, and we're trying to fish. Uh, Can we go somewhere else? They're not biting. <laughs> Yeah, let's go. I pulled the anchor up. We went to a place that's a little cove that was a little bit not as windy. And I pulled there and got up closer to the bank. And we could have fished on the bank and been better off. But we parked there. And, oh, they started catching fish. You ever been that way? You've been out fishing one day. And you, as you're fishing, you, 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 know, you get there. You're hoping you're going to catch one. You're all excited. And you're there for a while. And you don't get one. You don't get one. You know, if, if you, you see somebody else down the way catching them, you go, well, okay, there are fish in this lake. I do know they are fish in this lake, but I'm not catching them. Even seeing them catch them once in a while gives you hope. But I tell you what, eventually you may give up hope and go home. Give up hope and go home. I'm not going to catch any. Uh, you know, faith in the fact that, faith in the fact that there's fish there, faith... And, and faith and hope works together. Faith, hope, and love. 
They work together. You've got to have faith. I like the acrostic for faith, forsaking all I trust him. Forsaking all I trust him. And so when everything's going wrong anyway, just trust God. Trust God. Have faith in him. And sometimes hold on to that faith because faith keeps your hope where it needs to be. Because we, we can live without uh, food for about 40 days. I know some of us, three days is about as far as we can go most of the time. But we actually can live without food for about 40 days. We can live without water for about three days. Folks, we can't live without hope a day. People's got to have hope. The Bible says this hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We need hope. We need to give people hope. When we don't have hope, terrible things happen. Terrible things happen. I was telling people, like, how do you do your sermons? I, I don't know. God leads me to a passage, and then I'll read that passage over and over and over again. And then I wait for him to wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and tell me stuff. One night, there was probably a better part of this sermon, but one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, God woke me up and kind of like started giving me all this stuff. I said, oh, my God, that'll preach, that'll preach, that'll preach. But I didn't get up and write it down. I'm sure it was so powerful and so wonderful that I didn't have to write it down. When I got up that morning... What in the world was I dreaming about last night? It was so good. I told my wife, I said, it was so good. But I don't even know what it was now at all. But, I mean, you start, I just God, forgive me for not getting up and listening to your voice, even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. We need to get on the time, same time schedule and all stuff. And, but it's like little things begin to happen. Uh, we've been going through Genesis, and I was thinking about, you know, you, we're not good at getting rid of sin. We started, in a, we started in the beginning, and Adam and Eve was living in a perfect garden, and then they sinned, and then it's passed on to their kids, and Cain kills Abel. We start having these murders. We start having jealousies. We start having, because he cursed that serpent because the serpent was earthly, and earthly is, it's naturally to think earthly. And you get narcissistic, and you start thinking humanistically. And it's all about you, and it's all about me, and that's what happens at marriages. That's what happens in everywhere of our life, jealousy and all those kind of things. Thinking earthly. We only think earthly, and our dreams seem to be only earthly, and we don't think beyond that. Earthly. But, you know, eventually it gets so bad, it gets so bad, and eventually God sends a flood and gets rid of all the bad people, right? There's only eight good people in the ark. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And we find that the ark lands and he gets out and there's a beautiful rainbow. You know the thought that came to my mind that we see that rainbow. God says he'll never destroy the earth again by water. Lately I've been questioning that because there's been a lot of rain. But he said he'll never destroy the earth again by, a rain, by water and he gives us a rainbow as a promise. God keeps his promises. He may not come when you want him to come, but he never, he's never late, really, in his timing. But he gave it a rainbow. But here's the thing about God. You say, well, God washed away all the sins. Well, when they got off the ark, there it was. If the Bible is not telling us we're the problem, I don't know what he's telling us. He wiped all this, washed all the sin away. They get off the ark, and there it was. The sin was in them. The problem was in them. The depravity was in them. The sickness was in them. The Bible is telling us that we as human beings are highly flawed. We are jealous. We are narcissistic. We are earthly minded. We, are, we will sin given the least little chance we will sin. We will think up sins. <laughs> and we find over and over again, God has to come and rescue us. But is that not the story of the Bible, that we need a great rescuer, and the rescuer is Jesus Christ? He said, one day the seed of a woman will come and bruise Satan's head. We're waiting on that seed, and so the rest of the Bible is trying to, uh, to disguise and hide that seed until it gets to Calvary, where he dies as the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. He's always had you... In his heart. God has always been for you. There's never been a time that God has not been for you. And so hope. If we don't have hope we'll be sick. You find anybody that's totally lost hope. They'll be a sick person. They'll be a, a highly flawed 
individual. But I, I was thinking about hope and, and uh, this whole thing and that rainbow, Noah's rainbow, and, you know, what has that got to do with it? And, and I, I just turned around to the computer and I typed in uh, somewhere over the rainbow. Everybody, how many like somewhere over the rainbow? Hey, that's the most perfect song. Somewhere over the rainbow. It's beautiful. And like, what happens on the other side of the rainbow? Dreams come true. Bluebirds fly above the chimney tops. All that stuff. It's just a great song. And Dorothy gets to go home and her dog. And that one guy, he gets a heart. How many people you wish, you know somebody in your life, you wish they'd get a heart? And like, how about somebody in your life that you wish they'd get enough courage to stop doing what they're doing or to change their life? Enough courage. There's somebody in your life needs some courage. Or what about somebody in your life, don't look left or right, but somebody you wish would get a brain? <laughs> so that song become one of our favorites very quickly. But as I was looking that up, one thing popped up right underneath that. I, I saw the lyrics to Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and I saw reading about the writers of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. The song Some Over the Rainbow is one of the most well-known songs in the world. Whether you know it or not, you know, from watching Judy Garland, the, the song, the lyrics of the song was written by Yip Hardbug, son of a Russian Jewish immigrant. His real name was Isidore Hochberg, and he grew up in a Yiddish-speaking community of Orthodox Jewish people. The music was written by Harold Arlen, a Jew whose family immigrated from Lithuania. Together, they put together a song that has won awards and gathered global fame. Among other things, they won an Oscar in 1940 for Best Musical Original Song in The Wizard of Oz. But a little note, kind of the rest of the story, as we can relate to this song. We all have experiences where we have troubles in our life and we, we dream of a time when it, those troubles won't be so heavy on our hearts and we about lost hope. But the song was actually written about the Jewish people and the Holocaust. It was written by people that had experienced or their families had experienced Auschwitz, Auschwitz Germany, where the Jewish people was brought in and gassed and burned to death. Now it's a happy song, right? Next time you listen to it, how happy will you be now? But the song says, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. You got to remember these Jewish people are way away from home. They've been driven out. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. And the dreams that you dare to dream. Some of you come from childhoods where you dare to dream. There's no need to dream. It's never going to happen. It's never going to come true. Every time I've even tried to have a dream, I just got my heart crushed. So you find yourself sitting there, you don't even dare to dream. If you were waiting to be put to get death in a, in a gas chamber and ready for your body to be burned, how much would you have to dream about? What would you have to have hope in? Not much. But I'm telling you, without hope, you become sick. They had to hold on to a little bit of hope. So, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true someday i'll wish upon a star and i'll wake up where the clouds are far behind me i want to put a picture up here where troubles melt like lemon drops high above the chimney tops now do you know why that line was in the high above the chimney tops where they burn people the clouds of smoke Someday, someday, if I dare to dream, someday it will really come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star. Someday I'll wake up where the clouds are far behind me, where troubles melt like lemon drops. You know, you can take a lemon drop and it's really sour at first. But when you get to the sweet spot, 
The sweet spot in that lemon drop is even so great because the sour part was so sour, it makes the sweet part even better. Some of you have been through some tough things in your marriage, in your life, in your childhood. And just now you're getting to the point that you can maybe dare to dream a little bit. And just little things make you laugh. Little things excite you because it's been a long time you didn't have anything to be excited about. You didn't have anything to dream about. And the sweet is so much sweeter because the sour was so much sour than you ever believed. But high above the chimney tops, that's where you'll find me. Somebody's realizing one day I'll be out of this place and where you'll find me is in the ashes floating above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me. Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh, why can't I? If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? My grandchildren was at my house yesterday and it rained and we went out on the, I've got a big back porch and all at once, I was sitting there, and I was thinking about my grandkids and how grand they are, because they've got a great grandfather. <laughs> they got a grandfather and a grand grandfather, but that rainbow was there, and they, oh, look, a rainbow! And somehow, I felt once again, God was telling me something. God was telling me, I am the promise keeper. No matter what you're going through, there's better days coming. I'm bigger than your dreams. I'm, I'm bigger than your nightmares. I'm bigger than your hurts. I'm big enough to help you forgive people that you thought you'd never forgive. I'm, I'm big enough, God, to help you get over things you thought you would never get over. The song was published in 1939. The Jews in Europe were coming under increased hostility. And we, we find during their darkest, darkest days in history. How bad it was. But the, the joy that comes in the morning. You know, sometimes you go through a long night, but it says joy cometh in the morning. Ten years after this song was written, this most powerful words were fulfilled. There's a land that I've heard once of in a lullaby. The Jews dream of a homeland for their people finally come true. In 1948, Israel become a nation again. Just like God said. Just like he had spoken. You know what's going to happen in the end time? Exactly what God said is going to happen. Exactly like what God has spoken. He will do exactly what his word says it will do. I don't care what the politics say, the news say. It's going to wind up exactly like God says. Maybe you've give up on it. Maybe you've you 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 you're a hard time believing. It's hard time to get yourself to go to church, get motivated. But I'm telling you, God is telling us He's faithful to His promises. He is faithful to His promises, and we need to have hope when it's even difficult to have hope. The other thing is we need to learn to love. If you accept the fact that we're all flawed individuals, eventually you hurt people and you hope to God that they'll forgive you. And sometimes you hurt people and you hope to God they'll forgive you. Forgiveness is one of the greatest things in the world. How would we go through life? One psychologist said 83% of all people in mental hospitals today could go home if they knew they were forgiven. People are carrying some heavy loads and heavy uh, heavy unforgiveness and grief and bitterness. The bitterness become malice. Malice many times become malignancies. It starts in the core of the individual. And they won't let go of it. And it literally makes them sick to their physical bodies, their ailments. Learn to love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. The world is self-seeking, but God's people need to try to rise up above that. Not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Christian people should be the most forgiving, loving people in the world because we understand we're not better than anybody else. We just know that we're forgiven. We just know we're forgiven. 
When we stand before God one day, you won't say, God, you remember that one day when I really lived really good for you? And he goes, no. But I do remember, though, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And his blood sacrifice is what I welcome in. Everything under the blood. Put blood over the doorpost. It didn't matter who was in that house. If it had the blood applied, they all got to be the death angel passed by. The Bible is telling us that we're all flawed, we're all sinners. There's not one person who said all have sinned. In the Greek, the word all means everybody, all. <laughs> all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we're all flawed individuals that need forgiveness, that we need love. We need love from one another. We need love from one another. Love makes the world go round. Love makes the world go even Dean Martin had that right. Everybody needs somebody, right? Everybody. Everybody needs somebody to love. and Learn to embrace vision. I want to tell you something. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Yes, he can use you. God can use you. He can choose you and he can use you. And usually when he chooses us, we're not ready to do anything he chooses us for. But he tells us if we learn to rely on him through faith and patience and love and keep hope and keep going and be faithful, eventually that that he chooses, he uses. That's the God we serve. Embrace vision, for where there is no vision, people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Abraham and Sarah, they just kept the law. If you realize that the law is just trying to protect you, don't do this, folks. It's going to hurt you. You're not going to like it. The law, the ability to keep the law, none of us kept the law perfectly anyway, but the, the ability to keep the law doesn't make you righteous. It, Jesus makes you righteous. Jesus makes you righteous. Now, it, it's taken us a long time. Some people were slow to learn. You know what the Bible said? He that laughs, laughs. That means they're slow. <laughs> they don't get the joke very fast, right? Uh, the Bible didn't say that, but I said that. People that laugh last, it takes them a while to get the joke. But the thing is, without a vision, we'll, we're seeing in the Bible where uh, Sarah and Abraham, they were told they're going to have a, a son. Well, you know, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. They keep waiting. They're getting tired. They're getting old. And Sarah's saying, I, yeah, I know how women operate, and I can't even have kids anymore. And since I can't have any kids, I suggest that Abraham go unto Hagar, my handmaid, and that he get with her and that let's get on with this vision thing and that they have a baby. And so they have a baby and they call the baby's name Ishma. And the baby is about, I think, 12, 13 years old. And then God comes along and says, oh, yeah, that's pretty good little vision you've got, but I've got a better vision for your life than, than you've got for your life. And so, you know, like I told you, like I spoke to you, just like I said, you're going to have a baby. And Sarah was hiding in her tent when the Lord and the angels come, and she starts laughing in the tent, was peeking out. And she goes, I didn't laugh. And he said, yes, you did. <laughs> have you ever had something you wanted so bad in your life, and you went and about the time that the dream is dead to you, it happens. And it just makes you want to laugh. Oh, my God, it's really going to happen now. Well, here's the thing. I want you to remember this. You might want to write this down. God's dream and favor for our life is better than our dreams and our favor for our life. God's dream, God's purpose, God's plan for our life is better than our dreams, our plans, our purpose for our life. See, God, and God said, uh, Sarah named the baby Isaac, which means laughter. Laughter. And said, God made me laugh. You just think of thinking of that, I've got laughter growing in me right now. Every time I sit down at the table, I see Isaac down there, I just start laughing. He brings laughter to me. God brings laughter. He brings joy to me. You think of God's the one that created us. God gave us the ability to smile. God gave us the ability to laugh. You know, tears, they say that if, when you cry, that it, it, re, it reduces the stress in your life, the bitterness in your life. There's something that actually happens when we cry. God gives us the ability to, lie, to cry. 
How many leak sometimes? You leak a little bit around the eyes. I do that a lot. About, I barely seldom get through a sermon without boohooing a little bit. I'm like, oh, it's horrible. You can't even understand what I'm saying. But we leak sometimes. We cry, but it releases. Laughter also reduce, re- releases endorphins. And so we're going to see here that uh, this vision that they've got, they've got a vision. They finally accept a, a, a lesser vision. They accept an Ishma. Well, since we, you, we know the name of Isaac, we know that his name means laughter, I thought it would be good to go find out what Ishma's name means. And boy, was I surprised. Ishma's name means rebellious. We got any little kids here? It means rebellious ass. Some commentators end up putting in parentheses donkey, rebellious donkey, or rebellious ass. But I mean, you know what an ass is in the Bible. And so, <laughs> okay, Abraham and Sarah, if you're satisfied with this rebellious ass, how many, how many rebellious ass dreams do we have in our life that we go that's good enough it's good enough it's not what I wanted but it'll do and we go through life with this embarrassing lesser than dream or vision or purpose for our life when God's got something far better so finally when we give up on all our problem solving abilities and our abilities to make life better Finally, we give up and we go, I just give up. I'll just deal with this, you know. It, you know, it's cheaper to keep her, right? <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, that's how we feel sometimes. We just, we just like, uh, what do you do? I'm just making it. What it whatever is, you know, whatever. What is, is is. What does that even make sense? You know, Jerry Seinfeld said, whatever, you know, whatever. Whatever will be, will be. Uh, you know, it's, it's that mentality. But God had a bigger vision for them. I think about Ruth. Ruth, you know, her, her husband died, and, and she's thinking, you know, well, I could go back to my homeland, and I could be a widow, and I could do this. No, I think I'm going to stay, and I'm going to plant my feet, and I'm going to trust God. And, you know, she was one of the ones, she was at the edge of the field. They used to, as they mowed around the field or reaped around the fields, they would leave the little corners, which were probably harder to get to. And they would come and the gleaners could come and glean the corners of the field for food. And she was out there gleaning the corners of the field and Boaz come into her life. And boy, he was the man of her dreams. He, he was going to become her kinsman redeemer. You know, when, when, a, when somebody's husband passed away, they could wait and somebody in their family could be a kinsman redeemer. And, you know, then they could have a relationship and cause the seed to go on throughout that family. But she didn't have a kinsman redeemer. So Boaz applied and went through a lot of stuff to become her kinsman redeemer. Guess who's our kinsman redeemer? Jesus. Jesus, sorry. But you know what? There was a Boaz. But one preacher said, you know, he probably had some brothers. He probably had a brother that might have been called Lazy Az. Yeah, he was real lazy. Or he, he could have had, you know, an, a, a, another brother called Broke Az. And you know, and why would you marry Broke Az or Lazy Az when God's got a Boaz waiting for you? Because we get impatient and we think our dreams and our plans and our purposes are better than God's plans. And God's dreams and God's purposes are for us. And you know, that's why I said, those that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. And we need to learn to laugh. I love to hear you laugh. I, I, I just, I love when, and when people were really laugh. Oh, Brad was here in the first service and you know, he deals with all kind of horses, Bradley Bottoms. And uh, I told this story about this guy. He had a horse riding stable. How many likes to ride horses? Well, we got a few in here. This riding stable, he had, they had a sign up said, we have all kinds of horses. We have short, for short people, we have short horses. And for tall people, we have tall horses. And for skinny people, we have skinny horses. And for fat people, we have fat horses. And for people who had never ridden a horse, we have horses that's never been ridden. 
<laughs> That's the way you do it right there. That's the way you do it. But we need to learn to laugh. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. If we had learned to trust God and rely on God and realize that his dreams, his plans, his purposes are bigger and better than ours. I guarantee you that when you get to the end of your life, you'll say, God, when I started out, I never knew it meant this. I didn't, ever, I didn't know that it meant this. I didn't know that I was going to be happy. I didn't know that you were going to accomplish this, God. And you start finding out that God's been pursuing you. I love that song they done last. God is running after you. He's running after you. He's running after you. He loves you. He's got grace for you. If you'll let him, he'll get you out of this world. And he's got a place over the rainbow you can't even imagine. That's able, he's able to give you exceedingly abundantly above anything you can think or ask or imagine God's got something better for all of us. All of us. And you know what they say? The Bible says in Psalms 2 and 4, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Proverbs tells us strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs time to come. God wants us to laugh. I believe some of the campfires that Jesus was around were some of the happiest, funniest, telling stories. Jesus, some of his parables are just absolutely hilarious if you think about them, what he says in those parables. Uh, and they've, they said that people have a tendency to laugh with people 30 times more than if they're by themselves. If you tell yourself a story and you laugh at home by yourself, there may be something a little wrong with you. Because most people laugh with other people. I hate this quarantine stuff. I want to be back together. I want to be laughing with people, enjoying people. It was tiring having my grandkids there yesterday, but I love to see them laugh. My granddaughter uh, came up to me, Anna Drake, and she said, Papa, thank you for letting us come and fish. We really, really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. We love you. Happy birthday, Papa. Thank you for helping us catch a fish and baiting our hooks. And she was really thankful. It was like really from her heart. Now, not so much from the two boys. <laughs> One of them goes, Papa, I know how to throw it out. I know how to reel it in. And I know how to get worms out of the thing. I don't know how to put them on the hook yet. And I don't know how to take the fish off the hook yet. But I'm almost a fisherman. <laughs> I said, well, son, you just about are. You're almost there right now. Charlie Chapman lived to be 88 years old you know he was a I, it's hard to think of somebody always having me in silent films but he was so funny I mean knows what who I'm talking about Charlie Chapman well he got a few that's at 88 years old he said he left us with four statements nothing is forever in this world that includes your problems nothing is forever number two I love to walk in the rain because people don't see my tears some people, they say the shower is a great place for them because nobody sees them crying. The, the most lost day in your life will be a day that you didn't laugh. That'll be a very sad day. You get up in the morning, you go to bed, and you never laugh one time in that day. Six of the best doctors in the world, he said, are the sun. is a wonderful doctor. Get out in the sun. Rest. Sometimes you just need to rest. Rest is a great doctor. Exercise, he said, is a great doctor. Diet is a great doctor. Self-respect. You know why some people don't respect you? Because you haven't respected yourself yet. You, you haven't realized what a wonderful creature that God has made in you. Friends. Friends are a great healer. Since laughter is like a, a medicine... When you're around friends and you're having a good time and you're laughing, it's healing. There's something healing about it. Can you think of the, uh, a laughing time that you had with a bunch of people? How many can think of a time like, oh, my God, that night I laughed like crazy. It was crazy. 
Now, can you remember all the details? We went to some conference somewhere, and we laughed until people thought we were drunk. We went in this restaurant, and we couldn't order. We couldn't hardly get out of the van. We were dying of laughing, and for the life of us, we can't hardly remember what we was laughing about. We went to this conference. It was really good. It was really uplifting. We felt like, you know, hey, we're on the right track a little bit, and God is blessing, and, and it just felt good to be there. But they say you laugh with people you know. You really know. If you really know somebody... You'll really laugh. You don't care that they see you laugh. If you really know people, you can laugh around them. You can really be yourself, in other words, around them. And so friends are important. And so we need to laugh. Keep them in all the stages of your life and enjoy a healthy life, friends. If you see the moon, you see the beauty of God. If you see the sun, you see the power of God. If you see a mirror... Look in that mirror, you'll see God's best creation ever. Believe it. He created you. We are all tourists. God is our travel agent who has already defined our routes, bookings, and directions. Trust Him and enjoy life. Life is a journey, so live today. Tomorrow may not be. Tomorrow may not be. And so we go through this life like that, and God is a good God, and He cares for us. Abraham, you know, he's all about looking for that city. And when am I going to get there? You know, there's some people that go on a trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Some people live their life like that. Some people just drive along like we're just enjoying the trip. You ever been on a trip and you, you, you get there and you realize I should have enjoyed the trip because the destination wasn't quite as what I thought it was. Well, heaven's going to be all that in a bag of chips. I mean, heaven's going to be great, but we need to learn to enjoy the trips. Enjoy the people that God put on the trip with us. Love the people. I had a counseling teacher, and he said, here's the key to counseling. Love the people, love the people, love the people. That's true. It's the, it's the thing in business. It's the thing in, in, in church work. Love the people, love the people, love the people that God gives you to do life with. God gives us people to go through life. Love those people, no matter how aggravating they are sometimes. My staff never has no trouble with me, right, staff? <laughs> uh, they will not even comment on that one. It was these people there having needed to go to a counselor, and they said, one day I dreamed that I, I was in this camping tent, and I was in this tent, and then the next night I dreamed that I was in like a wigwam type tent. And I just don't know what that dream means. And he paid this counselor a lot of money to interpret his dreams. And he said, I think what I'm seeing and I'm hearing from you, if I heard you right, is what I believe your problem is, is you're too tense. <laughs> you're too tense. Some of you are too tense. You need to relax. Enjoy the life, enjoy the journey, laugh a little bit, get with some friends, and realize nobody will ever love you as much as Jesus loves you. I promise you. Emily's going to come out. I come across this song. Like the, the Rainbow Day was a big day for me. Somebody rewrote the words to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And just like the song over the rainbow had something to say to the Jewish people and what they were going through. I hope this song says something to you today because it's a beautiful rendition of this song. Thank you. 
My greatest desire and hope for you today is that you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Can we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, if there be one here today that haven't accepted you as their personal Savior, Jesus Christ, you're our ultimate hope. When everything else fails, we can still have hope in Jesus Christ. In this life, we will have tribulations. In this life, we will have troubles. But someday, someday, we're going to fly away and forever be with the Lord. Forever be with the Lord. Be with those that's gone before. What a great reunion that's going to be. If you don't know Jesus Christ today and you'd like to say, I want Jesus Christ in my life, will you slip your hand up? I want Jesus. Thank you, thank you. I want Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. He's the only way. He's the only hope. Life is not life without Jesus. Let Jesus come into my heart right now and forgive me of my sins. And don't don't be so... Just realize we all got sins. He's not just pointing at you. We all got sins. We all need a Savior. We all need to be under the blood. Don't let the devil beat you down. Don't let him disfigure that person in the mirror. God loves that person in the mirror. God loves that person in the mirror. He died for that person in the mirror. We 
ask that Jesus come into your heart and you walk out of here and you have a new step, a new spring in your step. You have a new laughter. You have a new ability to forgive others, but most of all, you have an ability to forgive yourself. What a great God we serve. Appreciate you today. I love you. I thank God for you. I'm glad you come out today. I believe God had just who he wanted to be here. I pray for those people online today that God would be with you. God bless you. Love you. We're praying for you. Thank God for you. Just pray for all our churches around the community. Some of them got even more of an elderly congregation. They haven't went back yet. But we thank you for coming today. May the Lord keep you and bless you in his love and his care.